right, everyone. I hope you are well caffeinated now or partially caffeinated from the, the feel of the room. Um, thank you to everyone who's joining us in person. Thank you to everyone who's joining us online. I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the Bravo Foundation for the Brazil Institute and uh, my own uh, initiative, the Serious Games Initiative, for collaborating, bringing all of these wonderful voices together in one space to talk about really critical issues in education, and that is how to use games for civic empowerment and civic engagement. Um, the Wilson Center, as Jane Harmon pointed out, has a long history of working with serious games from topics ranging from the federal budget to energy initiatives to coastal communities. We focus on games that uh, encourage engagement around political issues for a wide range of audiences. If you're here, you very likely agree with us that games are uniquely suited as a vehicle for education. Or if you don't currently agree with us, we hope that through our panel we convince you otherwise. Um, it's our belief that games can make policy real, tangible, and even, I'm gonna just throw this out there, uh, fun. <laughs> But the challenge becomes whether games can take people from the digital world to the real world in civic engagement. For example, with our award-winning uh, game, The Fiscal Ship, which uh, Cities in Play was modeled after, we took a topic only people in the 202 area code and or with an econ degree might find exciting, the federal budget. Um, we took this and we ran with it in partnership with the Brookings Institute we ask players to juggle their values with learning about this fiscal policy to try to put the federal budget on a sustainable course. We really believe that before you can act as a citizen, you need to understand what you're acting on. And so one of our motivations was to engage players through this game to learn about the federal budget, to learn about what goes into putting us on a sustainable course, but also once they are done playing the game, we hope that they call their congressperson after their, afterwards as a more informed citizen. Games that are designed to increase civic engagement are uniquely situated to help people contextualize the complexity of policy by making politics personal and intimate. But enough about me. Um, I'm sorry, I'll, I even forgot to introduce myself. I haven't had my coffee. Um, my name is Elizabeth Newbury, and I'm with the Serious Games Initiative here at the Wilson Center. Um, part of my role here is to create games as a platform for civic engagement. I'm joined by a wealth of other doctors on that. We have a full doctor panel here um, from, who bring in different perspectives, both from academia, from industry, as well as from government with our uh, friends at the Department of Education. And, let me just give you some background before we dive into this wonderful panel. First, we have uh, Dr. Diana Owen, who is a associate professor of, the political, of political science at Georgetown University in the Communication, Culture, and Technology graduate program. She serves as the director of Georgetown's American Studies program, and she has also been widely published. I, you can see the sheer number of books that she's published on this issue in the, the program but widely published in fields of civic education, political engagement, media and politics, political socia socialization, and elections and voting behavior. She brings a really interesting wealth of perspective on how we can engage people into um, civics and government. Dr. Kelly Whitney is currently the chief product officer for iCivics, the award-winning educational technology company founded by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She also serves as a committee chair on the board of directors for the National Association for Media Literacy Education and has been critically involved in children's education initiatives from a range of industry leaders, PBS, Discovery Communications, and Nickelodeon. Dr. Edward Metz uh, directs the SBR program at the US Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences, which provides seed funding for R&D innovations of educational technologies. He's also a visiting research associate at the Catholic University of America. Amer uh, Metz performs and publishes research on the impact of service programs on high school students' civic engagement. So again, we have a wealth of different perspectives and thank you so much for joining us. Without further ado, I will begin with uh, Dr. Diana Owen. Thanks very much, 
Dr. Newberry, who's a brand new doctor. So <laughs> just thank you. congratulations. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to first learn about this new innovative uh, game program and have the opportunity to kind of discuss the uh, ways that we can be, uh, get uh, young people involved through innovations in civic education. And that's something I've been particularly, let's see if I can get uh, interested in for my uh, entire career is how do young people um, learn to become engaged in politics and there's been a big shift from the time I was in graduate school and the, you know we didn't really have the same type of digital uh, revolution as we have today to today and the digital transformation um, of basically society in general has real uh, substantial implications for civic uh, education and it creates a lot of challenges for our civic educators um, there's an expanded role for civic engagement. Now, with technology, people have to have a range of additional skills. Not only do they have to have the uh, s traditional types of skills to engage, you know, kind of face-to-face, -face, as our keynote speaker was uh, talking about, but they also need digital age skills uh, for managing information and for engaging in political uh, and civic life. And at the same time, they also have to learn how to make these skill sets intersect. And I think that's a tremendous uh, challenge that civic educators, at least in the American context, have not been well prepared to meet. Um, the role of preparing students uh, to be digital citizens and to acquire the skills for offline engagement is increasingly being shouldered by civic educators. And there's not as many resources invested in uh, that, um, that, uh, that uh, process as I feel there probably should be. Um, I personally uh, study the middle and secondary school civics curriculum. And I look at the ways um, that students are being um, educated for citizenship and um, the way that they're being taught to negotiate the 21st century digital landscape. Uh, and what I find basically is that civic instruction lags behind shifts in the uh, social and political environment that have been instigated by technology. So a lot of what's happening in American civics classrooms, uh, specifically um, for underserved populations where a lot of my research takes place, really uh, is not preparing young people to engage in the way that is necessary to be active uh, citizens and effective citizens. There's a gap between what young people understand about using uh, digital media and how it's used uh, to engage in politics. And digital natives may feel that they have a lot of competency using digital technology, but that doesn't translate to the civic world or the political world. And this creates a tremendous challenge for teachers um, because it goes beyond simply using digital technology as an instructional tool. So what I find with a lot of my research is that um, in in the uh, middle and high school classrooms, p teachers are, are uh, instructing kids on how to use uh, you know, digital technology to access information and to do some research. As a matter of fact, the use of traditional libraries has really uh, fallen off tremendously and been replaced with going online and uh, searching uh, information. However, the step between you know, gaining knowledge and using um, digital tools just to access information and <coughs> creating this, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, impetus for engagement is a big one. And that leap has not been taken uh, very often in the, in the classroom because it requires a number of things. First, it requires fundamental changes in the learning environment. And I think the games that um, we've been talking about here and uh, playing with this morning really um, are an example of how that can happen. Um, typically, what I'm still finding is that traditional forms of, um, or traditional pedagogies dominate in the classroom. And particularly for underserved populations, they're lectured at a lot, as opposed to being able to, you know, partake, participate actively or do some sort of active, um, engaged uh, learning process. Um, it also calls for an open classroom environment where students are able to uh, interact in a civil way, they're able to debate in a way that um, you know, engages other people in a way that's respectful. Uh, and teachers also have to 
put students in a, a position where they feel as if their voice matters and, and to be treated uh, kind of respectfully. And I think that also goes along with what our keynote said today about how to, you know, kind of, it should be an exchange. There should be kind of an openness to it. And that's one of the things that I find most uh, often in my studies is that the open classroom environment is one of the most important aspects of promoting civic engagement uh, through education. It also uh, necessitates integrating digital resources into the curriculum in a way that facilitates engagement in political life. And I think this is the trick. And this is, um, well, I'm glad uh, we're talking about games here because active learning pedagogies like Cities in Play, from what I found from my research, can be very effective in instilling uh, in young people the skills that they need to participate in civic life. Um, it's active game, it gives them a, a notion of what's going on with the process, and um, it moves beyond just searching out information to actually engaging, um, which is the big challenge. So I'm not going to go through this next slide too much, but um, here I've identified a number of the major challenges, at least in the U.S. context, but I think they apply more broadly um, to um, digital age civic education. A lot of our schools lack the resources um, to even institute this type of um, pedagogy. Uh, I, as I said, I have a, a large project that's actually funded by the Department of Education. We have a Supporting Effective Educator grant, which uh, targets high-need students and high-need schools and teachers. And one of the things I found with trying to run some uh, studies using um, using online resources is that uh, some schools don't even have enough electricity to power the computers that are needed to run the study. Um, but given that aside, I think those things will ultimately catch up. But a lot of the students don't have access to the uh, kind of technology needed to uh, continue what's happening in the classroom at home. Um, teachers themselves don't have the resources that are necessary to implement the, um, the programs. And that's actually something I wanted to ask about the um, the games here, how are the teachers being uh, instructed and how to use, what's the curriculum that's built around that? Um, because teachers really, if they have a curriculum that in, that's uh, built, they're more, much more likely to implement it, particularly if it's something that's easy to use. Um, and in the US, there's a lot of focus on assessment at the end, and it's hard to kind of assess these types of tools in, in a way that um, you know, kind of meets a lot of the requirements that have been set up by school districts. So there's a lot of uh, difficulties in trying to teach um, or integrate digital learning into the classroom. So I've done a whole number of studies. I'll just talk here briefly about one that I've done uh, in 2016 that looked at the implementation of uh, digital pedagogies versus traditional pedagogies in the schools. And what I found is that um, traditional pedagogies really still dominate. Um, lecture, uh, Socratic method, class discussion, these are the kinds of things, but nothing that's particularly innovative and nothing that really puts the student um, at the center of, of, the, uh, of the conversation. Um, digital skills, as I mentioned already, were taught more often than traditional library skills. Um, and more than half of the schools uh, in my study had conducted some sort of digital civics project. Um, but most of all, they were kind of assignments where you do something online and maybe post a blog or something. It wasn't something that really um, went the next step towards promoting and fostering engagement as these games uh, can do. Um, and la less than half of the schools, uh, probably around 40%, had students engage in some sort of civics-related activity, like using an online platform to contact a public official or something like that. But again, uh, I think it's a step in the right direction, but um, it really didn't uh, go as far as really making that connection that students uh, to need to the next uh, step to the real world. Um, and um, few schools were using innovative activities. I mean, very small percentage, like games or plays or artwork or other ways of trying to get them actually involved in uh, the process. So I'm going to finish up by just briefly talking about, oh, yeah, so I just have this slide to basically to uh, kind of summarize the point that what I find is that active approaches to civic education are effective in instilling civic knowledge, civic dispositions, which is you know kind of a, a desire to take part or a feeling like you can take part and um, you know be effective, uh, and skills like how do I go and register to vote or how do I help um, formulate policy in my community. Um, 
Students in classes where games and other well-formulated learning activities um, were implemented, they learned more about government, so they had higher levels of political knowledge. They had a greater intention to engage as a result of being in the classroom that used that type of approach. Um, they had a greater um, intention to vote once they became of age, and they also developed a stronger sense of political efficacy that they could actually influence the system. And as I mentioned before, the open classroom, which I think you have to have an open classroom environment to play one of these games, I think effectively, is really um, key to having these um, programs be successful. And so finally, I want to talk just briefly, as I said, about um, the work that I'm doing. Um, I have a big project, again, thank you to the Department of Education, um, that looks at how high-need students, students from Title I schools, that students who are living in poverty, um, that uh, English language learners, uh, immigrant students, how, um, who typically have not had the same level of civic education can respond when their, their teachers are given the appropriate professional development and a program uh, that has active learning elements is implemented in the classroom. And I can talk about this more if anyone is interested, um, but basically what I find is that when civic education is implemented in high-need schools, um, the students actually learn quite a bit. There's a high learning curve. Um, it does improve their civic disposition somewhat um, and their civic skill level somewhat, but I think even a little bit of civic education goes a long way. And my real concern with this is the fact that the disparities in civic education that we have, um, they have long-term implications. And they basically contribute to, as I say here, the widening the civic uh, empowerment gap where the haves are the most powerful in the civic world, and the have-nots, starting at the education level, uh, lag behind and fall further and further behind. Um, so I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we have uh, Dr. Whitney from iCivics. Hi, everybody. We are delighted to be here. I first want to just thank the Wilson Center, um, the Brazil Institute, and the Serious Games Project for their kind invitation. We're delighted to present. And I'd like to present you um, some evidence of that the strategy of civic education and public education through playful learning is both smart and strategic. Um, all right, so. All right. So uh, as was mentioned, we were founded by uh, United States uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female Supreme Court Justice in the United States. Um, Justice O'Connor retired from the court and, be, and had been increasingly concerned with the state of civics education in the United States. Uh, civic education was actually one of the main reasons that public education exists in the United States. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, many of our founding fathers spoke about the importance of civic education. Um, and that we needed a public, public education system to make sure that our citizens understood it, um, understood how the government worked. Uh, and Justice O'Connor, uh, I have a quote from her here, the success of any democratic system depends on the active participation of its citizens. Our system will only thrive if Americans understand how and why our government and its branches works. Uh, she also has often said, you know, you're not born understanding how democracy works. It just, it's not in your DNA, you have to learn it. And civic education became marginalized in the United States uh, over the years, uh, in the 1970s and again in the early 2000s, uh, so that now only 39 states actually provide a civic education for the students as a required part of the curriculum as a separate course anyways. And, um, you know, and of the courses that do offer it, uh, sometimes it's one semester, sometimes <laughs> it's a year, sometimes it's uh, two years in some states. Uh, so it's very, um, it's very uneven and frankly, it was a pretty boring subject. Um, you know, reading about government, government is complex, and it's only interesting when you kind of bring it to life. When you look at it three-dimensionally, it's fascinating. Uh, so, at least for the majority of people, I know there are many people who like to read about government, probably in this room. But, uh, but you know, what, what we found is that the majority of young Americans don't know the basics of our government. Um, we have had some increases. You know, I know Brazil, Brazil, I believe, has a requirement to vote, is that? Or, or, yeah, right, and the United States does not. So in the last election, we, we did have 50% participation among young people, which was very exciting, uh, but you know, compared to a country like Brazil with 100% participation, it sounds abysmal, but, um, but you know, that, that is a much higher number than had been voting traditionally. 
Uh, all right, so the, the reason iCivics has been so successful, um, and I'll get to its successes uh, in a minute, um, is that it's free, it's online, and it's turnkey. And by turnkey, I mean that a teacher can turn on a computer, put her students in front of, uh, in front of the computers, provided they work, and, uh, and begin immediately playing iCivics. Um, and so iCivics, the, the, our mission is to provide a free, a free, excellent quality civic education to everybody, um, everybody in the United States. Uh, we are an American platform, but, um, and I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the needs of uh, many other countries around the world. Um, so we are now the most widely scaled free game-based learning platform in the country, we believe. Uh, so we have, um, we, we now offer 19 games. Um, these games are unique. They're designed to be played in 30 to 45 minutes. So it is in the confines of a single class period which is really important. Um, if a game is just a few minutes long or if it's too long, you know, if it requires weeks of play, uh, teachers are gonna have a tougher time implementing it in the curriculum. We also provide over 150 free lesson plans that go around the games, um, and we talk about a game sandwich. <laughs> and by that we mean teach the content, play the game about the content, and then teach the content again. And by doing that engagement activity in the middle, you really reinforce the content and we, we find really high uh, achievement results among our students. We're also really grounded in real world projects. That's a critical piece of the iCivics uh, formula for success. Uh, it's just so important that students um, get to look at real problems and think about real issues, not just um, exercises. Uh, they are age appropriate, but um, you know, but we we do have and we do have some funny little things in the games like uh, squirrels, squirrels who want to pay in nuts, that kind of thing. Uh, very <laughs> silly things for younger kids. Um, so at this point, you know, I, I so we we actually are beyond this. Sometimes we're a nonprofit, so we don't always have the the money to make new artwork. But we're actually at 170,000 teachers now, which is really exciting. Um, and so in the school year of 2016-17, we had five million students play the games, uh, which is just unbelievable. Um, and a lot of those students played leading up to the American election in November. Uh, we have a, a day in the United States called Constitution Day. Every September 17th, American teachers are required to teach about the Constitution now. And um, we typically will get 70 to 80,000 students playing our games in the, on that day. And it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a big day for us. Leading up to the election this past year, we started breaking the 100,000 number. We crashed our servers, actually. We, 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 went, we went down completely, so it was like a, we were so excited, but it was like a terrible problem at the same time. Um, but we were having 140,000 students a day play every day in the two weeks leading up to the election. So if you imagine 140,000 kids having the same experience, it, we were just beyond excited. Um, and iCivics has been recognized for high quality in a lot of places. Uh, just this year alone, Time Magazine named uh, Justice O'Connor one of the top 100 most influential Americans for her work on iCivics, which was really exciting. Um, and she considers this to be her, her legacy, iCivics. Uh, we think her legacy is probably going to be uh, you know, the first female Supreme Court Justice of the United States, but she considers this to be her most important work. Um, and then Fast Company also named us one of the top 10 most innovative educational companies. So I just wanted to highlight those two uh, little things. But uh, you know, I do want to also point out that there is research to back up our claims. Um, we've had a number of studies done about iCivics. And the most exciting to me is, I, I don't know if this print is too small, but the equitable benefits is, is really exciting. Um, st students across gender, race, and socioeconomic status all gained equally from our games which is just so, so exactly what we want. You know, we don't want our games to be biased towards any one group of students. Um, and the games are, are really exciting. They show uh, civic knowledge gains. They show better uh, writing ability and, um, you know, and civic participation. So uh, we're still trying to, I mean, we're still a very young company. We launched in 2010. Um, so we're only seven years old, and we're, we're moving into a lot of new audiences. Um, we're looking at adult learners. We're looking at, um, uh, we're looking at high schoolers. We were originally founded to do middle school work, and then we'll, we will go down and do elementary as well. We're trying to think of a lot of different contexts. Uh, we were originally you know, created to work in schools, but we're now thinking about how we could serve after school programs and how we could do a lot of different other types of, uh, of projects. So we're experimenting a lot. Um, and I did just want to highlight that one of the successes we've had is with outreach partnerships. Um, we're working with the Library of Congress currently to create some primary source uh, materials um, 
you know, using uh, document-based questions uh, and driving that forward. So that's an exciting partnership we're working on. And uh, we also are, we just launched an exciting partnership with uh, the National Association for Counties. Uh, it's a revival of a previous project that we had done, but it provides the counties work game, um, which is about local government and how local government works. And it provides uh, lesson plans, volunteer guide. Um, and the volunteer guide is really interesting. They have members across the United States who go into schools and talk about what local government does. And so we've given them something really fun to take into the schools. You know, they can take, they can go into a school, they can play the game with the kids, um, and then they can leave behind, a, you know, a fun poster. Uh, they can leave the teacher with lesson plans to do. Um, you know, so it's a really, it's a, it's, these kind of partnerships are the kind of, are, you know, part of the future of iCivics. We really want to work with people who have a real uh, stake in teaching about how the government works. And, you know, you know, education is important in every way, but this is critical to our survival as a democracy, you know. And so this is, it's, it, we consider this work of the utmost importance, and we're really fighting to find the funding to continue this work, to keep the games for free. Um, you know, it's, it, these are very expensive games to produce, frankly. So, you know, we do need to find great partners who believe in the mission and, um, you know, keep studying, making sure that we're doing the best we can to provide the students with the maximum learning. So, um, as I said, Justice O'Connor considers this her legacy. I won't be able to stay for the lunch today, so I did want to include my email address if anybody needs to yeah, talk further. Sure. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm doing that on my own screen. But, uh, you know, here's my email address if anybody wants to reach out and connect about iCivics for any reason. Um, I'm the I'm also the chief of partnerships. So I do I'm chief product and partnerships officer. So I'm the one you would talk to about any ideas you might have to work with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> now to pivot a little bit, uh, we'll go back Great. to government with uh, Ed Metz. Great. Well, um, when I was a kid, there was uh, Schoolhouse Rocks. So <laughs> wow. I think iCivics has. Uh, <laughs> has upped the game a little. Um, and I think uh, maybe my kid will be talking about iCivics in, in 30 years. So um, I'll tell a little story about my, uh, my graduate school research. Um, I studied service learning and how that experience can provide an opportunity for young people to engage in issues in their community and be active agents in addressing those, those issues and in turn uh, can develop important civic uh, dispositions. Uh, like Dr. Owen discussed, I thought that, I remember that measure um, very well from those days. So that was uh, 13 years ago, and um, if you had told me 13 years later I'd be sitting here talking about games, I would have uh, thought that was preposterous. <laughs> but I guess that's how life works. So I'm uh, here to talk about my work at the U.S. Department of Education on the programs um, that I work on and on uh, how civic games have uh, come to the forefront at the Wilson Center. So just a minute about uh, where I work. The Institute of Education Sciences is the independent research arm of the U.S. Department of Education. And IES uh, supports rigorous evaluations and uh, all kinds of research to figure out what is working in education. But as well, the Institute operates uh, funding programs for academics and for technology developers. Uh, I happen to direct two of these programs in the area of education technology. The first is a small business innovation research program, and that's a program for for-profit technology developers to create commercially viable learning technologies up to a million and fifty thousand dollars for two and a half years. The second is the Education Technology Research Grants Program, and that program provides funding for basic research, for development, or for efficacy or effectiveness evaluations. And the funding levels for that program range from 1.4 to more than $3 million. So if you're developing technologies, these are some good programs to know about. So, um, I threw in there that the programs also fund the development of learning games. And in recent years, millions of students in tens of thousands of schools in all 50 states have used technologies out of these programs, um, including many of our learning games. So uh, the learning games go across all subject matters, not just civics, but science and math 
and reading and history. Um, and just a couple of remarks on learning games. Uh, 10 years ago, the question was, would teachers, would schools use the word game alone, let alone uh, use in a classroom? So 10 years we've, later, we've come very far. It's not a question of whether schools or teachers will use games, but how can we optimize games to impact student learning? Teacher implementation of the games is a critical piece in that. A lot of our projects have a mandatory research piece that figures out how those games could actually be used in classrooms. So um, today, the uh, education content is making its way. Um, if you looked at a map of all the courses that occur K-12, there may or may not be a game uh, for that particular area or that unit, but we're making good progress in filling in that map. And right now, um, a lot more games exist. However, it's still really hard to find a quality research-based game. Uh, so if you're a teacher and you go to one of the different marketplace uh, index platforms, aside from iCivics, of course, um, you know, you might not be able to find a game and you know, might not be able to find research on the efficacy or evidence that it leads to learning. So we're making our way in those areas. So looking ahead, uh, no pun intended, the big question is can games be the game changer in education? We know that games are very engaging for students. We know that games can assess students as they learn. So could we actually eliminate those scantrons or those end of year tests with a game? That would be really amazing. So looking ahead 10 years from now, uh, the hope is that some of these games can can supplement learning outside of class, can replace some learning in class, can facilitate a teacher's lesson, and can serve as assessments. Okay, that was my long-winded introduction. Now, switching to the, to the topic of the day, um, games to promote citizenship. Uh, game, civics is indeed listed in our request for proposals, so, Five years ago, eight years ago, we, we saw the need to focus on civics and we put the word civics in there and I did some outreach and said, hey, can we get some great proposals for civics interventions? And lo and behold, um, we have some examples now. And several of these projects are leveraging advanced technologies to offer new models of civic learning and active and informed civic participation. And I'll give you five quick examples. And by the way, I have YouTube videos from uh, all of these examples. So just shoot me an email, I'll send you the URLs for these. The first is a game that has not yet been finalized. It's, uh, it's in one of its many uh, beta versions right now. It's called Eco by Strange Loop Games. And what's unique about Eco, it's a sandbox game it's been described as the Minecraft for education by the Washington Post. And a sandbox game meaning that students uh, go into the game and it's a pristine virtual environment like this. Uh, but then from there, the whole class of students is challenged to build the civilization together. And that sounds wonderful. But then as they each build their own little plot of land, they're all taking resources and they're all having to work together. So it's creating a virtual environment for a democratic uh, civilization to unfold. And it does teach environmental science, but it also is teaching students about laws and making their own rules. In that sense, it's providing a simulated environment uh, for democratic uh, participation. And that's a, that's a smart work there. It's a spectacular uh, game. I've tried it out and um, I encourage you to watch the video. Another example of a civic game, which is also in an eco environmental uh, simulation platform, is EcoMove, developed by Chris Deedy at Harvard University. And I don't know if Chris would be happy about me calling it a game, but I, I'm going to sneak that in there. 
And um, EcoMove, multi-user virtual environment, is a virtual environment that students go into and explore different environments like a pond or a mountain or a park. And they try to figure out why, what's going on with uh, environmental issues. And they can do different inquiry-based uh, science explorations. So in that sense, it's important for students to <coughs> have that virtual experience that they can apply to maybe their own uh, backyard. But what really uh, upped the game in terms of civic engagement was the development of EcoMobile. And EcoMobile is an augmented reality uh, technology intervention that students can use their iPhone and explore the real uh, pond in their backyard. And the AR technology gives them different uh, tips and prompts and lessons to learn from. So this truly is an example of an intervention that moves from virtual to real and gets kids out there in the, in the real world. And um, there's a really good blog on the website that talks about how important that is for, um, for bringing both of those uh, opportunities into play. Global Ed 2 is a classroom-based simulation uh, and the whole class is participating at the same time. Each student is given the role of a different country. They're told there was an oil spill or some issue that occurred around the world or a war or a natural disaster. And the students have to take the perspective of their country and, and come to a solution. That's my daughter there on the bottom left. I had to get her in there. Um, <laughs> We did a demo last year at the Department of Education, and, um, and the students were absolutely uh, more alive than I've ever seen a classroom, and we had to drag them out of the uh, room. My daughter was Italy, oh no, it was England, and I was proud of her. She wrote, we agree that we need to work together. <laughs> so what could be more democratic uh, than building consensus towards a solution for an oil spill? Um, Global Ed 2, I'm not giving it the proper credit it deserves right now. Um, Discussion Maker by Film and Games is another um, exciting example of how technology can facilitate learning. So when I was in school, we did mock trial back in fifth grade or eighth grade. But it's very hard for a teacher to implement that intervention. So with uh, Discussion Maker, with an iPad, the student's role is uh, provided in their own iPad and the process of interacting with their students and building consensus and making arguments is all scaffolded and built into the technology. And lastly, Mission US, and it's not necessarily a traditional civics game, um, but within these historical uh, lessons and role-playing activities. Students certainly learn about the history of the United States, the roles and responsibilities of being a citizen, and also the roles, the role that government plays in supporting its citizens. So in Up From the Dust, that was about the, uh, the Great Depression and how a farmer could survive that and the role that the government played in adjusting the price of grain and a uh, very interesting historical game and, and could be very much viewed from a civics lens. So a few things to consider in one minute. There are many different genres or types of civic games that are emerging. And yesterday when I was running, I thought I need to write a blog on genres of civic games. So give me like two weeks and if it's not out yet, <laughs> then, then email me, say, where's the blog? Uh-oh, I just created an impossible uh, deadline for myself. Okay. <laughs> Um, the games are facilitators um, for face-to-face for -face dialogue and collaboration. Um, I just figured that out yesterday when I was putting this together. I'm like, my gosh, this series of technology-based interventions is leading to really rich conversations and collaboration. Um, civic learning games are multidisciplinary. They're not just for a civ civics class, but they could be for that uh, environmental science class or for different purposes. They also can uh, enrich traditional interventions like, like the mock trial or 
that can provide new opportunities that nobody's ever thought of for civic engagement and development, like ECO, where 30 kids are building a virtual environment together, but then having to come to class the next day and argue about uh, some resource that disappeared about how they're going to save their environment. Um, lastly, I didn't want to give short shrift to research, but all these projects are research-based, and the research evidence showed that they can be implemented in a school-based situation on a small scale. These are all highly engaging. They all show promise for improved academic learning and different types of ci civic dispositions. I use the word promise there because there's a need for more rigorous efficacy research to test these at a greater scale. And obviously, there's an incredible need to add another 20 uh, civic engagement uh, technology-based interventions. A couple fu funding opportunities are there. Take a picture of that one right now because I'm moving on. But uh, And we also have an Ed Games Expo on January 8th where you can come back from Brazil to test out some of our games. Great. Lastly, my email is there and connect with me on LinkedIn. And you can view video demos uh, there or email me and I'll send you all the information. And I look forward to um, collaborating and partnering with all of you. And one, I think Walter said when he got the email about this uh, event, he yelled out, yes. And I, uh, I felt the same way. It was like, wow, my whole life in one seven minute talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, everyone write down the email, two weeks. You heard it right uh -oh. here. <laughs> So I'm going to, while we get the microphones ready for uh, questions from the audience, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege uh, and ask the panel a quick question. Tying all of these discussions together, one theme that I thought was really interesting that you guys all talked about from different perspectives was this idea that, um, as Dr. Owen put it, students at the center of the conversation for civic engagement and game learning particularly for the classroom. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about these new models for civic engagement that games provide us and how it may be shifting a little bit from our traditional pedagogy uh, approaches. Well, I'll, I'll start, um, I'm gonna defer more to the games experts, but uh, one of the things that I think is important about games is that it's group-centered learning. And so students work and interact together, and the teacher kind of facilitates that. So the students become part of the entire process as opposed to being talked at. Mm -hmm. and, um, and many of the approaches you know, to civic education, particularly the traditional, it's you know, teacher talking to student, student talking back. And if in many places where I've seen uh, kind of digital civics being implemented, teacher has to deal with one student at a time there you know as opposed to these games where the students can interact particularly the one that we looked at here um, so I think that's one step towards making it more student-centered and also interactive and uh, group related yeah and I'll, I'll build on that our games are designed um, in a way that you can play uh, t collaboratively um, you know we I had a picture on here of students playing one one child to one computer, but we also, I would say the majority of classes we visited, uh, it's two students on one computer or three students on one computer. Um, but teachers can also play, we have teachers play the game as a class, and the teachers at the whiteboard and the students make decisions about what they're gonna do next. So that's another way that there's a collaboration. But in terms of our game design, that's another way that we really uh, think about how the student can have agency and have that sense of empowerment. So in our games, um, you know, when you read a civics textbook, you're reading about those people, you know, they're in the government, and when you play the game, you are in the government, right? You're, you, and you're not just, you know, a, a citizen, you, you know, which is an important role, but, um, but you are the president, or you are controlling all three branches, uh, you know, of the government in the United States, um, or you're the swing vote on the Supreme Court, making it the final decision about how a case is going to be ruled. So when the students get to be in that kind of a powerful position, it, you know, it changes their view of, you know, of their own access and their own ability to connect with these concepts. So I don't know if you have any. I think I could talk forever on this question. <laughs> um, so uh, ECO, I mean, I'm not the developer or the researcher, um, but ECO, I think, is an exciting uh, case study. Um, each student needs to pull their own weight or their little plot will be, will not, nothing will happen. 
And each student will then have to have their own voice to fight for their own space. Mm -hmm. And in a virtual environment, that provides the rich opportunity to have that type of uh, 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 discussion. Another thing with Global Ed too um, was the students taking on that role or identity of a country around the world. And just watching that unfold and uh, students yelling out loud, Italy can't do that, you know, mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. that type of um, interaction. And the teacher uh, can be the facilitator and then we can have the model of uh, active engaged learning. Yeah, and another thing that you all brought up was this idea of creating real life examples and real tangible grounded issues that the students can really relate to as part of the experience, which I think is definitely a theme that plays into both the fiscal shift, but also cities in play here as, a, as part of the conference. So anyway, uh, mm -hmm. yes, we have a question up front. Yeah, uh, one quick observation. This issue of impact came up in Sao Paulo. And uh, we had there Rafael Parente and another scholar of this. And they raised the question. I wanted to know from you, I, if I understood what you said, is that you know the data is being collected but has not been yet fully analyzed. It's a work in progress in terms of measuring impact. Mm -hmm. Am I understanding this right, off games? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll answer. It's, it's a tricky thing because one of the things that has been um, challenging is that, you know, when we talk about students' knowledge of a school subject, you know, we want them to be informed, we want them to understand career paths that are uh, available to them, but just, you know, we want an informed citizenry in general. And, you know, in some cases we've had people try to tie our games to, well, are, gonna, are more students going to vote? You know, and that, it's a little bit of maybe an unfair leap, you know, to assume that that's the case, especially in the United States where it's, you know, it's your decision. You might be deciding not to vote. So, it, you know, so there's a, there's a question of, like, how do we measure impact um, in that case? Now, there's some really interesting research that Ed and I were just talking about um, in the civics dispositions area, civics indicators. So we talk a lot about are you career ready? Are you college ready? Are you civically ready? Are you ready to participate in your community once you're 18 years old, you know, and you're an adult in, in this country? Um, and so there's some research coming out of California from uh, Joe Kahn, who is just terrific. And uh, he's, he's looking at um, different things that show that you have participated, that you've been learning about these items in school. And that's the kind of research we're really excited about. Because, you know, the civics education, I think your framework is a little different, but we think about civic knowledge as our primary goal at iCivics. You know, do you understand how the government works? Then there's civic skills, which I think you define a little differently. Civic skills for us is, um, do you know how to analyze evidence? Do you know how to tell if a, you know, a newspaper article is real or not? You know, that, that kind of thing. Do you, do you have, like, the critical literacy skills? Um, and then we think of civic engagement as the third piece, which I think is a little tied in with what you're doing. So civic engagement for us is, you know, that piece of like, do you know how to find out who your, your congressman is and write him a letter or her a letter? Um, and then that all leads to sort of civic dispositions, hopefully, that you are an informed citizen, you're deciding whether to participate, you know how to solve a problem in your neighborhood if there is one, um, that you want, you know, you're interested in voting or you're consciously choosing not to. So, you know, so we, we, we evaluate mostly civic knowledge, but we're also looking more and more at civic skills. Um, civic engagement is not our primary goal as an organization, but it's something that we care about. And but that dispositions question, like how engaged will people be, that impact, that lifelong impact, it's such a robust and rich question. It's one we, we all are very interested in as an organization. But those longitudinal studies, those take a lot of funding, a lot of preparation, and we're very interested in doing that. But, you know, but it's, it's as a seven-year-old company, we don't have that data yet. So, so we just, uh, the Institute of Education Sciences um, funded Global Ed to be developed, and that took five years. Then Global Ed applied for and received an efficacy uh, trial grant, mm -hmm. and that took another four years to study the uh, efficacy at larger scale. So that type of research does exist. Now, I can't remember if Global Ed tested uh, civic measures of civic engagement. Uh, I'll look back this afternoon on that one. I think their primary area of, of interest was uh, in academic, environmental, uh, eco-science learning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one example, but in general, the field, um, I would say, is at a point of showing promise. Mm -hmm. and, that, and to us, that would mean smaller scale studies that are underpowered, their sample size is not large enough to say that 
the, the effect could be generalized to a larger uh, population. And then secondly, implementation research is, uh, has been a great challenge in the sense that it, it depends then on how uh, able a teacher is or a school is to implement it with fidelity. So anyway, research is another great panel that we could set mm -hmm. for uh, this yeah. afternoon. <laughs> I'll just briefly say that my studies are kind of larger scale and not focused specifically on games, but I do have some data on students that actually were in classes that uh, where games were implemented, and the, the findings are promising. And one thing that I think is kind of interesting about the students that um, had games as part of their curriculum and also um, that took part in projects where they actually became involved in the community, that they have a more realistic sense of how politics works in terms of sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, which is something that games can teach um, that I'm not sure always is part of the curriculum uh, in civics. So um, I, I, the limitations of my research, I, I'm not focusing on a specific game. It's did they get a game or not? But again, there's some promising and, and I think interesting, unique contributions of games. Any other questions? Lots of hands. Great. Um, yeah. We'll start from the front and work our way around. Oh, okay. I'm, in, uh, I'm Stephanie Tansy. Um, I work in my community, which is Brightwood uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm curious, uh, w we want a more engaged community that's uh, interdependent, more interdependent, more working together, not for just political reasons, but because it's healthy. It's a healthy way to develop. And so I was wondering if you have games like that. <laughs> and also uh, the, the, um, the value of um, politically engaged means something, but actually working to develop your community together means does that mean the same thing to you or, or not? Well, service learning, uh, if schools can have an active service learning program, they can uh, identify issues in communities and s design specific projects to address those issues. Um, that, that movement hasn't quite uh, caught, captured the potential um, and the momentum isn't as strong. Uh, then. A, a research question is how effective is, is service learning at leading to civic political engagement? And the answer depends on what type of project is done and then what type of reflection the students engage in. So you could do a great project of delivering um, food or, or cans to a, a soup kitchen to help local uh, in members of a community. However, if there's not an explicit alignment or link to um, to discussing about policies that a local government might have or mechanisms from a political perspective, it might not get through. And then as far as games go, um, I, would, I would love for someone to come up with a, a way to, uh, to gamify a service experience. I've been thinking about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I would, it's such a good question. Um, I mean, I, I think games in general and our games definitely model collaboration and interdependence, um, you know, of different groups. You know, we've been thinking a little bit about, um, you know, what are called big games sometimes, you know, where you play in the community. It's not a digital game. It's, it might have an augmented piece to it where you're playing different roles and trying out different things. But what it, one of the, you know, one of the biggest problems we've had as a society is the erosion of civility. You know, and that has led to, uh, you know, people don't know how to disagree with one another. And that is one of the skills we think is important that we look at when we think about civic skills. Um, it's an area that we've been talking a lot about internally, actually, and trying to think about how to, um, how to you know, how to best model and, and look at that kind of um, behavior. As communities become more diverse, there's more different ideas, and it's, it can be harder for people to listen to one another. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a good question, one we're really thinking about, you know, a lot, too. So thank you for that. I actually want to, I have a tiny uh, bit to add to that. So if you flip the script a little bit and think of people who play games, there's a lot of research um, coming out of USC, um, for example, that look at this concept called Erstats, which is community engagement and how we engage. Um, and there's actually some evidence that people who play these AAA games, so like 
World of Warcraft, League of Legends, the big titles, that they tend to be more involved in the community. And it's preliminary research, but it might be something if we don't have a game specifically about community engagement, playing games could also, some research is suggesting, result in more community engagement offline. Hi, earlier when you were talking about civic engagement and the education tools that we're developing, uh, there was talk about originally they were aimed at uh, junior high school students and then later high school students. Uh, is there been anything that we've been gearing towards adults themselves? I'm thinking primarily because we need to get them to become better facilitators if our children are going to grow up and actually apply these things. But we're not really targeting the people who could really benefit the most from yeah. civic knowledge and civic skills. Hi, Carl. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we, and, and I, I love that you asked that because we're, I mean, that's one thing that we're really thinking about right now, too. I mean, I, you know, iCivics is at a funny point because we completed our middle school curriculum, which is where most kids in the United States get their learning. We've been, we've been working on high school now for two years, and we actually have started writing some proposals about, high, about adult learners and thinking about how to engage them. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, the times that civics education was marginalized meant that most, most people in the gener, Gen X and in the millennial generation got a very limited civics education in this country. So um, people before that tended to have a, a pretty decent one, but after that it, it fell off and it's very uneven. Um, so, you know, so we have a lot of adults, you know, two generations at least that don't have it. And, you know, this next generation that's coming up is also suffering from not having it. So um, it's pretty critical that we figure out ways to engage adult learners. And, you know, we, I had an interesting conversation, I, you might have even been in the room, that where we were talking about the fact that uh, a lot of our iCivics games are, they're fun for adults. I mean, adults play our games all the time. It's not, um, it's not that they aren't, they're too young for adults to play. And I have, I was just, I actually gave a lecture yesterday at NYU, and I was with a group of students who were trying the games and playing them. And when I said, okay, so let's finish up the games, I'm like, no, 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 we were still playing, you know, like, you know, uh. these are graduate students, you know, they're all in their late 20s. And, you know, it's, a, you know, and, and I've had, you know, many, I can tell you many more anecdotes of adults that love the games. So, you know, we, we have to figure out a way to, to get them to them. Um, you know, they're all free on the app stores. Uh, they're only available on tablet because of our screen size, but so they're not available on phones, which is a limitation. But, um, but yeah, campaign specifically to let them know about our games is, I think, a good, a good start for us. But um, I just want to add, sorry, really quick, uh, fiscal ship is for adult learners <laughs> as well. Most of the initiatives actually coming out of the Wilson Center are geared for adult audiences, policymakers. Um, that's fiscalship.org, fun for all ages, and uh, <laughs> available on mobile tablet desktop <laughs> Sorry. oh no I was just gonna say that uh, I've been doing just a little um, little bit of work with a colleague in Indiana who is trying to implement or has been implementing uh, opportunities for adult learners to go to libraries and with a civics instructor and learn and it's all voluntary and it's interesting how it's been catching on and the you know the, the group sizes have been growing and um, it's very low tech at this point but so we do little things like civic quizzes and things and even just that is important to a lot of uh, adults. And then we've done some testing to see how much they gain from it, and it's a lot. Um, and they enjoy it. It's also a way of forming community among people that are you know, kind of interested but don't feel like they know a lot, and then they can get together. And this is where the, I think face-to-face -face learning also helps. I think we have time for one more question. And so the gentleman on the aisle right there. Thank you. Uh, I want to mention that I'm part of a group called Fields of View in India where we are using urban uh, games for urban issues for a variety of them. In fact, recently they just released a game to understand the role of gender in society. Similar to that, most of the games we have built are uh, for adults, uh, including emergency response for rural areas, rubbish is a game. Uh, allowing people uh, who manage driveway centers coming from the informal sector to join together to invest in more driveway center, thereby reducing the amount of landfill. Uh, and also, another game we have developed called Cantor's World, which is to teach people about different economic indicators, including GDP, the International Wealth Index, and so on, for UN uh, in uh, the UN University. And one of the main points I want to make here 
is given that India has 21 languages and 524 dialects, <coughs> we have an incredibly interesting problem, which is not everything can be done in the textual world. Mm -hmm. So we have to mobilize the visual world along with the textual world and the audio world in creating this game. And I think this is a different kind of a challenge than we face in a place like US. <coughs> and uh, I, in fact, one, of such, one such game was a game for pastoralists to understand the needs and requirements of people who lead pastoral life. Uh, I'm just giving you a sm small sample of these things. And what we have found is quite a bit of engagement from a variety of uh, people from the society. So I just want to make one remark, given that it is uh, sponsored by Brazilian Institute, uh, the, the famous uh, Brazilian philosopher Roberto Unger said, imagination does the work of a crisis without a crisis making it possible for us to experience change without ruin. Imagination cannot do this work unless suitably equipped. I think games are a way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for joining us today. And you all have their contact information. Don't hesitate to reach out if uh, your question wasn't answered. Thank you so much for coming.